Hi, everyone, and welcome to another issue of the People's Health Dispatch. Uh, and today uh, we are uh, here to uh, talk about the nurses' strike in the United Kingdom, uh, which was a historic event, actually, in December last year. So uh, we're joined here today by Anthony Johnson from uh, Nurses United UK, and we're going to talk a bit about uh, what the strike is about, uh, what the nurses in the UK are uh, asking for, and what we can expect in the months and weeks to come. So hi, Anthony, and welcome. Welcome to the People's Health Dispatch. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Anna. So uh, just, you know, to uh, to start, uh, maybe it would be useful to talk a bit uh, about the reasons behind the strike. So, you know, we've heard a lot of news about uh, the cost of living crisis uh, in, uh, in the UK, rising inflation and essentially, you know, what what has been going on with the nurses and why uh, what has led to the strike? Yeah, sure. I mean... The reasons for the strike are pretty simple. It's related to our patient safety. Um, you know, for the last 12 years in the UK, uh, nurses or any NHS professionals or any healthcare professional in the UK hasn't had an inflation meet and pay increase. Um, so that means our pay has fallen, uh, we think, by about a third since 2010 for the average nurse. Um <clears throat> That's meant that you've got about 50,000 nursing vacancies across the UK. We've got about 135,000 vacancies across the entirety of our health system. So it's other roles. Um, and that ultimately puts our patient safety at risk. This year alone, though, inflation now is at about something like 14% in the UK. Um, so the government offering 4% when they'd already cut our pay substantially is a bit of a kick in the teeth. Um, and, you know, and it shows that they're you know, throughout this process, because obviously, as you mentioned, we've been taking industrial action. They've refused to negotiate with us. They've hidden by, you know, arms and bodies that they control. Um, and it's because they want to privatise the NHS. That's what we know this is about. This is, it, it, you know, people are trying to sometimes say that this is about just the cost of living. But we know that this is about whether or not I'm going to have nurses with me on the shop floor on, at the end of the day, helping to care for my patients, whether or not I'm going to be able to do my job properly and whether or not the UK, you know, we're going to be able to keep our NHS, which is something we're really proud of. Unfortunately, this government doesn't seem to be pleased with it. And actually, you already touched upon two of the things that I think uh, health activists around the world have been discussing a lot. And so uh, that's the current state of the NHS, uh, which uh, for such a long time was uh, put forward as uh, as a bright example of how healthcare can function and how public it can be uh, and how it can put uh, health workers and patients first. So uh, maybe we could just spend a bit of time talking about what's actually happening in the NHS and what have you seen uh, when it comes to privatization trends there? Yeah, sure. I mean... Back in the day, before I was even born, the NHS has been trying to get privatised. So I'm, you know, almost 30 now. And since Margaret Thatch in the 80s, there's been plans to privatise the NHS. Uh, one of the, uh, I think he was a former chairman of the Conservative Party, Oliver Letwin. He wrote this playbook on how we would privatise the NHS and they followed it directly, have the Conservatives. And unfortunately, had have the Labour Party under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown as well. So... We introduced an internal market where we had to put services up for tender to potentially private organisations, even though the NHS is the only body can, that can deliver it. So we waste £5 billion pounds a year, every year doing that. You know, we built hospitals with private money, uh, but the interest rates on them are so high that, you know, for an investment, I think it was initially of about £10 billion, we're going to have to pay about £90 billion over the course of those loans. Um, and we can't renegotiate them because the government will is not there. Um, you know, it, th there's loads of things that has been brought into, like, you know, a failure to put a workforce plan in so we don't have enough staff. Um, back when, I in 2000, we were writing about how we had an ageing population, not just of patients, but of our staff. And now we're getting to the point where a third of nurses are about to retire in the next five years. And the, that's about 150,000. The government is saying, well, we're going to train 50,000. And everyone thinks they won't hit 50,000. But even then, they're just the aspirations from them are not, are not there. Um, and it's because they're taking money from private interest. They want to privatise the NHS. Um, I would argue globally, um, ideologically, if you're a private healthcare organisation, it makes sense to try to take down the NHS 
because it stops other countries from moving towards us. And I would say at the end of the day, the NHS is in name only now. It doesn't it doesn't provide a universal service. We've got ambulances queuing outside A&E with patients taking two days to be handed over um, to be able to get a bed. You know, we can't discharge patients out into the community once they're well enough to do that uh, because there's no social care provision and no community provision. Um, and those are the things that have changed, you know, drastically over my lifetime. And it's not what the NHS is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be a universal system, cradle to grave. Um, I know don't look it, but I'm actually Anglo-Indian and my grandma's one of the nurses who came over in the 60s um, to help build the NHS. And, you know, she came over because of like the aspirations of what the NHS would be. And I feel like heartbroken, to be honest, that I'm a nurse who got into the role because I wanted to make a difference, got into the role to, um, you know, contribute to public service like people in my family have done. And I, I'm probably going to be one of the people who gets to see the NHS go out because the thing that's happening in the UK is, and I think is going to be the thing, is instead of re- destroying the NHS, what they're going to do is keep it as a brand, but make it so that the state is providing private health care. Um, very similar, actually, to Medicare for All, you know, the aspiration for the US. Um, and the reasons I've always had concerns with that is, well, what stops the private sector putting up prices and making loads of profits and money? The NHS, the, you know, a universal nationalised system is the solution to that. Um, and unfortunately, it is being attacked, undermined. Um, and I just hope that people, you know, globally, but also in the UK, have the wherewithal to fight for it. Because, you know, if if it's gone... Um, I think it's going to take a lot of work to bring it back. And um, we need to, I think there's a responsibility in the UK for us to keep it as like this example of what healthcare should be. And at the moment, it's not doing its job properly. I think it's very interesting you should mention that because, you know, we've had, um, I mean, not a similar experience, but we have seen similar trends uh, here in the Balkans. So, you know, uh, starting from something that was a public and a universal health system uh, back, in, uh, back in socialism, and now uh, where we're, we're moving gradually or not even so gradually towards privatization. And it's interesting to see how the people relate to the system, uh, which was once accessible to all and, it, you know, it, it was supposed to provide them care opposed to the government, uh, which uh, has essentially lost that perspective. It's now presented as something that cannot be done anymore. Uh, it's um, it's like they're saying, oh, you know, it's too big of a problem for us. We cannot solve it without the, without the support, let's call it that way, of the private sector. And that's, of course, you know, something that you've been dealing uh, with in the UK for quite a bit of time and through a couple of governments now so maybe also useful to to know to to know a bit more about how the government uh, is reacting to what you are trying to do right now yeah i mean so the government's refused to negotiate um and they're doing that in every single industry though they refuse to negotiate when we've got rail strikes going on they ref- they the thing the government i would say is successful at is having very strong messaging um, to the point where they just won't answer questions or have any accountability from the press at the moment. Um, so despite the fact that we, paywalls in the UK for the NHS are awarded by a group called the NHS Pay Review Body, um, it's supposed to be an independent body that it sets our pay award. The problem is, is that when the government wants to put forward a pay award, uh, they say that it's not allowed to go outside our targets for inflation, they set the budget for it. They appoint the people on that body. Um, I think there was someone who uh, used to be on there from like some farming company. So I think there's only one person who actively worked in the NHS anyway. Um, so they're forced to award what the government wants them to award. Um, and even then, once they did that, uh, the government refused to fund the meagre pay award that they did. Uh the government are hiding behind this body now. They're saying, oh, you know, it was an independent body that decided your pay award. Um, and then they're refusing to negotiate with any of our trade unions. Um, they're refusing to talk about at the moment a story that's been going throughout the UK this week has been that our entire NHS is collapsing. There's a, a massive outbreak in flu in COVID. Um, and so it's meant that, you know, the stories I was talking about, there's people waiting two days to be able to get in hospital in ambulances, which is something that we'd never saw in the UK before. Um, 
there's tons of critical incidents being declared all across the NHS and everybody, you know, across the NHS is saying like the NHS is literally collapsing, you know, right this week uh, and the government aren't doing anything about it. And I personally think that's because they want to wait until the strikes take place again on the 18th and 19th uh, of January and turn around and blame the strikes for it. That's what they want to do because they do that all the time, you know, in every single sector where, especially even where they've privatised it, they've created the problems. They're the ones who set the policies, but then they just wait for an opportune moment to blame uh, workers in this case or members of the public, depending on what service it is. And that's, again, I think something that, you know, we can see uh, in different countries uh, because it's uh, it's always uh, when a health worker strike uh, uh, happens, uh, the the government is quite quick to say, oh, you know, the nurses they're putting their patients behind, they're leaving their patients behind. They don't care about what happens. The doctors are doing the same. The ambulance drivers are doing the same. Uh, when in fact we know that uh, the health workers take industrial action when there's no no other option left. So it's actually about protecting the health system. And that's why it's important that uh, you're still planning to to do industrial action over the next weeks. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that, perhaps? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's actions that are going to be planned. Um, so so our, our main union for nursing is the Royal College of Nursing. Um, actions planned if the government doesn't come to the table. Um, they're already making signs that they want to give us another real terms pay cut with the 2023 award. Um, and I think that one of the important things that's been important in the UK, but I'm sure globally, is being like we've seen how little care there is from governments and sometimes institutions about healthcare workers, even in a global pandemic where people are literally dying. Um, there was about, I think, something like a thousand health workers in the UK who died because we were in bin bags, a lack of PPE, um, and because our government through cuts didn't put put any um, emergency plan preparedness. So we know the cash out and we're going to keep doing it um, until we get the government to come to the table. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much, Anthony. Uh, if uh, maybe you want to add something or if you think that uh, there's something that we should keep an eye out in particular over the next uh, next weeks, this is the time I've, to do I've... so. Yeah, I, th I think that, like, obviously, we really appreciate any support and solidarity. Sorry, I can see my room's getting a bit dark. We really support, uh, appreciate any solidarity from anywhere around the world uh, with these strikes. Um, and if anyone's got anything else going on, we'd obviously want to support it too. Um, but the other thing to just remember is, uh, you know, the, the government's behaviour and the way that they're doing the, this, the way that they're behaving affects people, unfortunately, globally. Like, the government failing to train enough nurses because I was part of a campaign to try, you know, protect how many nurses we trained back uh, like seven years ago has now meant the government's plan to hit its workforce targets is to hire nurses from the Philippines and from India. And in these countries, you know, they obviously have a lower ratio of nurses um, to patients than we we do. You know, they have a worse ratio. Sorry. Um and so ultimately, that's the problem of like our fight is everyone else's fight. We know that our healthcare systems are connected. We know that we all need to be supporting each other. And um, because if we don't, it's going to harm us all. The six million nurses, I think, short globally. Um, and it shouldn't be the case that we're taking advantage of nurses from the global south. Um, and unfortunately, because I, I work in Essex, what you see is uh, we're promising people a better quality of life and the ability to help you know, send money back to their families. And it's not the case. Inflation is so high that you can't like get by. You're living in really inhospitable conditions. Um, unfortunately, because the, I would say the NHS is institutionally racist, being treated like dirt as well sometimes. You know, the, the nurses who are international nurses were the nurses who got moved to work in hot wards, uh, unfortunately, because of how the NHS operates. Um, that shouldn't have happened. And that's the thing, you know, we need to make sure that, we all stick together in this fight because everyone should have a freedom to be healthy, basically. Thanks so much, Anthony.